Hey, you took a shower? Thanks. Yes. Uh, I'll take it down there uh, in a little bit. So that's 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 the thing. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to get into today's topic of uh, what is food justice and why do you why should we be growing our own food? Uh, let's see. Uh -huh. Let's see. All right, can y'all see the? Uh, Screen does it is it show does it say Southside Growers Boot Camp Academy? Okay, all right, boom. So uh, we started the South we started the Southside uh, Growers Academy in 2017. Um, right after I started working at Lewis Ginner, um, me and my brother from high school, uh, Randy Miner, uh, he was starting a garden. So we said, "Yo, let's let's do a boot camp to get some people trained up in how to do this type of work." So subsequently, we've done about three. This is the fourth one. The first and second were strictly about traditional growing methods. The third we did on indoor agriculture. So, you know, in future iterations of this, you know, we're going to, you know, you'll have an opportunity to learn about the hydroponics and the aeroponics and the aquaponics, uh, all the ponics, you know, uh, the different alternative systems that you can use to grow food as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, so yeah, so this course is, uh, is, is four weeks. Um, and like I said earlier, I'm trying to cram a lot of information into a very small window. Uh, what I hope to be able to cover, uh, see starting, uh, soils and compost, uh, growing techniques. Uh, we're going to talk about pest control, beneficial insects, uh, and plants and, uh, companion planting. Uh, and biodiversity, and then uh, one of the things that I'm, I aspire for us to do, um, this is a participatory kind of thing. Like I'm, I'm not just going to be here dropping information on you, and you, and, and all you do is listen. Like I, I really want this to be interactive. So part of that is that um, everybody that joined the class, you got an email asking you to fill out uh, the mini farm profile, right? Um, and I'm, I ask you to, to, to complete that because that's going to be connected to, you know, you developing some sort of a, a visual layout of what you want your space to look like by the end of the, by the end of the four weeks. And on, on the last day, you know, we'd like to see, you know, what you've come up with in terms of your design for your space or spaces, plural, uh, so that you can have in hand not only a description of what it is you're trying to do, which would work well for you putting together a proposal, but you'll also have a visual. I'm a really big uh, proponent of, you know, writing it down. You know what I mean? Like if you want to do something or you aspire to do something, 
the surest way for you to begin to think about doing it is to write it, get it out of your head and bring it into the physical world in terms of, you know, at least put your idea on paper, take your dream and turn it into a plan, right? And so when you put the visual to it, you know, now you have something that you can aspire to. It's like, yo, all right, I wrote this thing down. I've drawn a picture of it. Next step is to make it happen. So, and I'm here to, to work with you along the way. Uh, so we've already done uh, our introductions and we're gonna slide right into the presentation. So um, we talked about your food narrative, you know, what you, uh, what some of the things that you remember as, uh, as far as food is concerned. Um, this is week one. Our first objective, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about what urban agriculture is, the history of it. Uh, we're going to talk about the principles of organic farming and gardening, because uh, there's a lot of misconceptions in, as it relates to that. And then uh, we'll talk about the issues uh, in the food system that make this type of work imperative and, you know, how it relates to community health. All right. Uh, let me see. Uh, my notes going. All right, so the first thing was first is we're going to talk about urban agriculture and we will work from a definition uh, of uh, urban agriculture being the growing, processing, distribution, uh, and distribution of food and other products uh, through intensive plant uh, planting and animal raising within the city. All right, and so when you notice when we talk about urban agriculture, we're not just talking about production of food. We're also talking about the processing and the distribution. Um, I'm going to say this, and you might you you hear me say this over and over again. Urban agriculture is not just growing food in a community garden. That's uh, that's the most you know referenced aspect of urban agriculture. But when we talk about urban agriculture, we're really talking about systems, food systems. How do we grow food and get it to people? within the city, right? So when we talk about urban ag, when we talk about, we have to also talk about food, the food system. And so in this definition, what we're talking about is not only the growing, we're also talking about processing, which that sounds like a big word, but it's really like, yo, all right, I grew these tomatoes, let me wash them, right? And put them in a bag or a cart and Get, get it to somebody. That's the processing part. The, the, the distribution is the sale or the giving away, right? Uh, processing also is inclusive of like, yo, somebody might got some extra tomatoes, they turn into a barbecue sauce or a spaghetti sauce, right? Or they got some peppers, they dry them out, crumble them up, put them in a little bag. Now they got, you know, paprika or, you know, they do the same with some basil. So processing doesn't have to be a bottling factory with vats and big things that are mixing stuff. It's like, what can you do in your kitchen? Is somebody making body care products out of herbs that they grew in the garden? You know what I mean? So that's processing. So all those aspects of this work are equally important, right? It's, you know, one of them cannot live without the other, right? Um, Another aspect of the food system, we're not really going to get to, we'll probably get to it, but not too much in depth because that's a whole class by itself, is waste management. How do we compost? And how do we create a closed loop for what we're growing all the way down to after somebody's ate it? How do we put that back into use on the farm? Okay. So, yeah, so just a quick definition, try to get, get, get y'all up to speed on what we're talking about when we say urban ag. And it looks like a bunch of different stuff. It's like somebody could grow, you know, uh, a garden where they tilled up the soil. Somebody could put in raised beds. You know, somebody could do a hydroponic garden inside of a school. You know what I mean? It's, it's a lot of different ways that it looks. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of the ways that this looked for me, you know, along this, uh, this uh, journey that we've had in the last 12 years doing this work. Uh, like I said before, uh, this is uh, uh, McDonough Community Garden, and uh, McDonough Community Garden is the oldest garden uh, that I've worked with. It's the first one that I started. Uh, McDonough is a 
uh, maybe like 10,000 square foot, maybe 20. It's not even, it's not that big. It's like less than a quarter. It's like a quarter acre on South side. Uh, this is in smack dab in the middle of Swansboro and Woodland Heights. So if you know Richmond, uh, and you know Forest Hill, uh, uh, it, it basically bisects Swansboro, the neighborhood of Swansboro, and the neighborhood of Woodland Heights. McDonough Community Garden is right on the border of Woodland Heights and Swansboro Community, and, 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 the, and the community of Swansboro. Swansboro predominantly black, Woodland Heights predominantly white. You know what I mean? It, it basically looks like the city's, you know, how, how it's been segregated. But at McDonough, you know, this community garden has really had a really significant impact in the neighborhood. Um, like I said earlier, it's 30 raised beds. The way that this community garden works is you pay, uh, it's, a, it's, a pro, it's, a, it's a garden that falls under the Richmond Grows Gardens program. That's uh, important, that's a major key. The Richmond Grows Gardens program allows you to pay a $50 permit fee and you can transform a piece of city property into a community garden. Then you pay a $25 fee every year afterwards. This space is uh, one where uh, individuals lease a plot from the garden. So they pay $25 a year and they get a raised bed, six by four in size, access to water, access to compost, and you know they could do whatever they want to do as long as they don't uh, use any inorganic uh, or, or they don't use any chemical pesticides or herbicides on the space. Here we got a shade structure in this picture depicting, you know, this is also a communal space. This is a space where we've held dinners, classes, workshops. So it's not just about the growing, it's also about growing, it's not just growing food, it's also growing community. You know, um, at, at the, you see that also represented at Bra Rock Community Garden. But this is an example of what, uh, what these types of what community garden spaces can look like. You know, we, 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 we took very intentional time to try to create a space where people that weren't growing were able to use it as well, okay? Uh, this is another uh, ver view. This is what we call, this is McDonough again, this is what we call fruit alley. Uh, there's about 20 fruit trees planted along the median strip uh, at McDonough. There's pears. There's plums, there's apples, there's peaches, there's cherries, and there's goji berries, blackberries, and um, inside the garden there's gumi berries, uh, which is another type of berry. I, I just found out about it like two years ago. But it's the, the, the whole space all throughout the summer is producing fruit. So you can walk down the street and walk down the sidewalk and literally – Pick a, pick a plum, pick a pear, pick a peach, pick an apple, and, you know, get, get, get it going. You know, some blackberries. I, we even have had graduates of our program to go back to the processing piece, take produce or uh, take fruits from these trees and turn it into products. So my man, John Dawson, he does these uh, pepper jams. So he grows peppers. He took fruits from this garden mixed it with the pepper, mix it with the peppers and pectin and all that type of stuff, and literally was at the Richmond Night Market selling out of dips for your chicken wings. It was it was bananas. I mean, I'm telling you, you made like a couple hundred dollars in a day off of this. And he didn't have to pay for the fruit and he didn't have to pay for the peppers because both of them were grown right here in the city. Um this is a corporate garden that we did some years ago. This is Sabra, uh, you know, like the hummus. If you're aware of Sabra, they got a, a processing plant down in uh, Colonial Heights or Chester. Um, and they contracted us back in 2015, 16 to help develop a garden for their employees, which was weird, but it's, that is what it, that's what they wanted to do there. They felt like their employees didn't have access to healthy food. They wanted to bring the garden to the to, to their employees. So we put, you know, 10 raised beds, you know, some fruit trees, picnic tables, as you can see. 
uh, this space was really, uh, it was a lot of labor, but it was good. They paid us like 50 Gs to do it. <laughs> so once you know how to do this stuff, you know, you never know. Anyway, um, the, the, the garden beds, uh, they grow the food and give it away. Uh, but they, they also do like cooking demos for the employees and the whole stick. It's a really dope spot. And I just showed this as an example of, you know, what, what garden spaces also can look like. So yeah, as you can see, uh, not only we have the grower areas with the trellises and everything, but you also have a really nice pad and, you know, uh, seating area. Uh, one of the things I can't stress enough is that when we're doing urban ag, it's very important for the space to also have some level of aesthetic appeal. You know, this is a grow space in the middle, typically in the middle of a neighborhood. Um, you know, it might be different in your backyard, but if you got a front facing space, it's important for you to think about how I design this space so that the people that are walking past it are proud of it being a part of their neighborhood beyond just the fact that it grows food. How does it beautify the neighborhood? So yeah, I'm just, you know, throw it in there for that. Um, this is uh, Harding Street Urban Ag Center. Uh, like I said earlier, I worked for Virginia State University for several years developing an indoor farm. And in this space, what you see are vertical towers where we grew food aeroponically, which is basically the roots of the plants were suspended in the air and a pump was circulating that water on a timer, you know, dropping water and nutrients onto the plant roots you know, producing uh, green leafy vegetables or whatever else you want to grow. But in this case, uh, we were growing uh, uh, kale, we were growing lettuces, we were growing mustard greens, and basil, and things like that. So really easy to grow crops, which you'll learn as we go along. Um, down in the front of here, these are uh, this is a, a flood and drain system. This is an alternative method of growing food. Both of these methods, aeroponic as well as uh, flood and drain systems, they don't require soil. We use substrate or growing medium in the aeroponic system. The, the, the plant's roots are suspended in the air, but in the flood and drain, we use uh, different types of substrates. In that case, we use what was called lava rocks, uh, these little orange rocks. And what happens is that there's a vat of water, there's a, a barrel of water that's, that has nutrients inside of it. And on a timer, the water would be flooded into the buckets, like kind of like you would breathe in. And then it would uh, sit it for a few seconds and then release it and breathe it out, right? And so inside of these type of units, you can grow things like tomatoes, peppers, because you know it has a lot more area for the roots of the crops that you might grow. Um, also over here in the right left, uh, the upper right of the of the image is what they call these were called mega gardens. This is somebody's really amazing idea of like creating a rotating barrel where the plants grow inside of the end uh, of the barrel towards a light that was affixed in the middle. And then in the back, uh, there's an aquaponic system. This was called. There's a couple different types of those. Um, this one was called a deep water culture system, where the plant roots were suspended in water but the nutrients came from fish that were in vats that were, you know, living in the vats. And as the fish, you know, produced their waste, that fish water was circulated throughout the system and it would feed the plants. You know, that is a really, and as far as my experience, I think it's one of the most phenomenal methods of growing food uh, that you can, that you can uh, have because it is a closed loop system. Uh, and you don't have to add no fertilizers or anything. You just got to feed the fish. Um, at the top, these are all different types of lights that we um, uh, use to grow food. Um, this is Swansboro Community Garden. Uh, Swansboro uh, is one of, is another older garden that we started. is probably back in 2014 or something like that. Uh, Swansboro's Community Garden is owned by a church. This physical lot is owned by a church, uh, Swansboro Baptist Church. On this site, it's 24 raised beds. In the back, there's a high tunnel. Um, there's a water line established on here. This garden doesn't, this garden now does uh, 
least leases out plots, but it didn't always do that. It, it, it used to just be a free for all. Uh, this is a school garden, George Wythe uh, edible garden. Um, you know, we put a bunch of raised beds in the inside of George Wythe. Um, this is Fifth, Fifth District Mini Farm. This is an in-ground garden uh, where uh, on Southside in Swansboro, uh, this is the backyard of my comrade and somebody I went to high school with, Randy Miner, who also graduated one of our programs. Um, and this is the space that we uh, use for training in, in the first couple of sessions of the uh, of the uh, boot camp. So yeah, this is this is this is an amazing space, and it's evolved from from this into uh, something else. I will we'll probably end up seeing that before this before the sessions are about. Um, so yeah, so urban agriculture has been around for a long time. Um, the fact is is that all civilization, all human uh, groupings from villages to towns to cities to states. They evolve based on human beings developing systems of food production, right? So any, so we can go all the way back to the earliest civilizations. You know, you think about Mesopotamia, you think about ancient Egypt or Kemet, you know, the only way that those spaces could uh, exist is that there had to be food for people to eat in those spaces, you know? Um, even when we talk about the indigenous people of the Americas. You know, people like to give this idea that these, that the indigenous people of this country were, you know, foraging for food, you know, or were nomadic or what have you. But the reality is, is that when you uh, do, when you do the research, there are indigenous growing systems, farming and agriculture happening way before Europeans came to the Americas. In fact, you hear hints of it when you hear about the pilgrims coming and being taught how to grow corn, squash, and beans, but then we never really think about, well, you know, all across the country there were indigenous people too. They weren't just eating buffalo. Like, you know what I mean? That's That would be crazy. But what we've learned is that, you know, all indigenous civilizations have had methods of growing food. Uh, 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 you know, once we evolve from that forager, hunter-gatherer type of deal, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, we've been growing food for a long time. But a recent phenomenon is people not having access to healthy food, you know? So in, 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 in the case of Richmond, Virginia, uh, you know, there's a huge issue with lack of food access uh, in the city uh, which is a result of a lot of different factors, and we're going to cover a few of them from here. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with this map, but this is a map of redlined. Uh, uh, this is a map from the homeowners homeowners loan corporation, uh, the the HOLC uh, in the in the 1950s. Uh, the uh, U.S. government developed the Federal Housing Administration. Uh, the uh, Fair Housing Administration, and they went out to try to help Americans procure wealth through one of the most uh, popular means out there, which is uh, uh, home ownership. So uh, in the case of Richmond, like many other places, uh, African Americans were unable to uh, acquire funding for homes and refinancing of homes and mortgages uh, based on race. So uh, when you see this map, you see these red areas. These are all areas that African Americans lived in uh, and still do live in in the city of Richmond. So uh, a conversation about food access. I'm, I'm just starting it here about the red line. We can go back and talk about what access to healthy food looked like on a plantation. You know, access can be defined in many ways. There's a lot of different subsets of that conversation. One of them being, is it available? Do I, uh, can I afford it? Uh, is it the food that I like to eat? Um, is it, uh, uh, is it quality food? Uh, so if you're on a plantation, you know, you're growing food for everybody else, 
but are you able to eat the food that you're growing? You know what I mean? So you might be in proximity. You might have proximity to the food, but that doesn't mean that you have access to it, right? So in this case, when we fast forward to the 1950s, it's a way more palatable conversation for people. And it's also recent. My grandmother, her birthday, uh, her birthday was July 4th. She's passed away now. She would have been 106 years old. She was alive during redlining in the city of Richmond, right? So my great grandmother lived through, you know, this, this the housing discrimination that has created pockets of poverty that has precluded predominantly black and brown communities from having access to healthy food or proximity to healthy food in the city of Richmond. Um, so what happens is that in a redlining situation, if you're black, no matter the quality of the neighborhood, you were denied funding for home uh, financing or mortgages. And if you live close to the blacks, you were denied, you were, you got a lesser grade. All right. So that's what, um, that's what this map looks like. But this map is a foundational map because it helps us understand what else is going on in the city. So that map matches today's poverty uh, levels in the city of Richmond. So we go back and look at the, the, the redlining map, the same areas that were redlined are, are impoverished today, right? And then when we look at where all the fast food is in the city, uh, because that's the thing, when we talk about food, that's people like, there's no food. I was like, yeah, there is food, but it ain't food that's healthy for you, right? So it's like McDonald's and the bodega, the corner store, you know, you got Burger King, and all that stuff, and this is the map that shows the concentration of those uh, corner stores and uh, or uh, and fast food restaurants. What they some people call a food swamp, uh, and where they're located in the city of Richmond. And if you look at the map again, it's concentrated in areas that are formerly redlined, areas that are predominantly black and brown in the city. This is a map according to the USDA of areas that have lack of healthy food access. These are what they call the food deserts, right? And if you look at this map, it looks just like this map, but, you know, it's a little bit more expanded, you know, and they did that. Anyway, uh, this is the map that we use when we talk about lack of food access. Um, as you can tell, you know, it's concentrated in the south side and the east end, and then it's speckled inside, inside the north side. And these are all areas I grew up in Southside. All of us are familiar. There are very sparse uh, grocery stores in these communities, but if we look at the area in the, in, the, in the West End, we see that these areas are not showing up. And if you're a native Richmonder or if you've been here for a while, you're probably familiar with a place called Carytown where you can park your car at uh, uh, Elwood Thompson's and walk across the street to what is now about to be a public. So then you can walk across another street to uh, the Fresh Market, and then you can walk across another street to uh, Kroger. I think it's Kroger or Food Line or whatever. Uh, so that's four grocery stores within a four block, a, a, a one block radius, like literally like a square, like four square blocks with each square block having some sort of a grocery store inside of it, right? Uh, so, you know, when people say, well, you know, why don't we just get a grocery store to go into the hood? It's like, well, you know, they don't want to go to the hood. You know, they, they, they rather have, you know, four grocery stores sitting on top of each other in Carytown than put one, you know, in uh, communities of color. So there's a whole conversation about how race plays a part of that, how income levels play a part of that. But at the end of the day, you know, everybody has to eat. So, you know, these questions of grocery stores, we'll probably get into it later, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time digging into that tonight. Uh, this is another map of the food deserts, just overlaying uh, high concentrated poverty areas. So the deep red are areas that are considered high, po high poverty areas. Uh, and the purple is just, you know, what areas are uh, food desert. I threw this, this one in for good measure. So there's, there's intersectional environmental issues happening in our communities. This is a map of the tree canopy that exists in the city. And so as you could tell, 
it follows the same map of the redlining where the neighborhoods that were uh, formerly redlined don't have access to trees, and that causes a bunch of other issues. Uh, we talk about heat islands. Uh, a heat island is an area where it's hotter in the neighborhood than in other spaces. So if you don't have trees, the trees help mitigate the heat. They absorb the heat uh, in the neighborhood and also just absorb other forms of air pollution as well. But in the summer, like right now, it's been hot for like two weeks, two, three, well, yeah, maybe like two weeks. It's been like a heat, heat wave, right? 90 degree weather every day. So in our, in, in the neighborhoods that don't have access to trees, or that are urban heat islands, while it might be 90 degrees in the West End, it's actually 100 plus degrees, you know, in the neighborhoods that don't have trees. The, the areas that have high levels of asphalt and all that type of stuff are also um, more prone to heat-related illnesses, like heat stroke, asthma, respiratory issues, and all that type of stuff is what's popping off in the, in the communities that don't have no greenery, that don't have any green spaces, that don't have any gardens, right? So part of our work beyond just the food justice piece is also environmental justice and how we transform neighborhoods so that the uh, so that the mitigating those those types of events those uh, heat related illnesses and stuff like that can be mitigated through uh, the installation of green infrastructure like trees bushes gardens and etc. All right, so uh, let me see. Yeah, I'm sure I'll cover everything. Um, before we get into what is organic, uh, there's a, there's a bunch of gardens in the city, uh, and I, I neglected to put a map in here. But through the city of Richmond's uh, Richmond Grows Gardens program, there's at least twelve, and then beyond that, there's a bunch of organizations that have developed gardens across the city. And then, of course, there's, there's no way possible to count all the private gardens of people grow, gardening on their own. Uh, but you know that we are working. Things are happening, and the, the the city is shifting, and it's becoming greener. And it's, it's through the efforts of people like yourselves who have uh, taken upon themselves to want to be a part of this work and this practice of greening the city, but also greening it so that people have access to food. Um. So yeah. So so what is organic really? Right. We grow food organically. Uh. I like to use the word organically, but sometimes people get it misconstrued. They think I'm talking about one thing when I'm really talking about another. Um, so just for all intents and purposes, um, I'll be using the word organic, but I also use the word naturally grown or biologically grown, right? So, you know, that, that I might be interchanging those words, but know that when I'm talking about growing food, I'm, gro I'm talking about growing food without chemical pesticides, herbicides, or fungicides. So that means that I ain't spraying, you know, no miracle Grow or, you know, nothing from no Roundup, nothing on any of the crops that we grow, period. Right, like we don't do it like that. Um, our methods for growing food uh, are all natural. So we use soil amendments. We uh, use best practices for uh, keeping our crops watered and, 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 and mulched. And we make sure that our soil health, we'll talk about all that in a few seconds. So um, most of us consider uh, you know, the word organic uh, when we go into our grocery stores and we go buy things, but farmers are also able to apply for an organic certification. That we do not, I'm, we, we don't go through that process. Um, there's, a, there's a whole controversy around organic farming, right? There's your, your farm can be 75% organic and you still get an organic designation, right? And even the food you eat, it could be 75% organic and you, it still gets an organic label. So, you know, you got a question, what is organic when, you know, you can get some food that is 75% organic? Like who, <laughs> what's the other 25% in the food? I mean, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so 
yeah, the uh, when we talk about organic, predominantly we're talking about uh, the fact that we don't use any chemical fertilizers, we don't use any herbicides, any pesticides, and we also avoid and do not uh, promote anything that's been genetically modified, right? Um, you know, genetically mo modified foods is all up in the conventional agriculture system. And like it or not, you have, you too have eaten a genetically modified organism. Probably, I'll bet money that you have. But I mean, we can debate it, I don't know. But most of the corn, soybeans uh and this most of the corn and soybeans in this country are genetically modified that's a fact like there's no getting around it so if you eat bread <laughs> you know what I'm or tortilla chips or uh if you drink a soda uh nine times out of ten what you uh, ingested came from a genetically modified organism, right? Uh, but genetically engineering is basically the techniques where, you know, they use biotechnology where DNA from one plant or an animal has been uh, spliced into a plant to create an entirely new creation, right? The genet So that GMO is the result of some plant, animal, plant, bacteria, uh, has been combined, right? And it's, it's, it's now on the market being marketed as, uh, as safe. So, you know, I, I have friends, people that are science advocates that are like, yo, man, there's nothing wrong with GMOs. And I have elders that are like, yo, this is gonna be the death of human, human civilization. I ain't telling you to pick a side. I just tell you personally, you know, for human safety, from my vantage point, we grow everything biologically, naturally, or organically. You know, we can use those terms interchangeably. Um, so what is what what does it mean? Uh, well, you know, the USDA uh, gives people a designation. You got to pay money to the USDA to get certified organic, and you know, we ain't trying to pay no money for the, to them uh, to 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 get uh, certified as organic. It's just a lot. And we rather use other metrics. Uh, so there's a whole movement around certified naturally grown that you can get, uh, where you're reviewed by other farmers for your practices, and you know, you slap, slap that label on, and you get to go. Um, <clears throat> another important thing to, to for me to note is that there's a difference between a GMO crop and a high and a hybrid. Okay. Look, we, you know, I, all of us, we, we study and, you know, you might hear about people talk about, you know, hybrids are not good or whatever. Like, look, I'm telling you, that at the end of the day, we've been, human beings have been hybridizing crops for as long as we've been farming, right? So a hybrid, uh, a hybrid crop is basically when a plant of the same species, right, or the same variety, uh, or the same the same family, get in close proximity to each other, right? And pollination happens, and the pollen from one variety of the same family crop gets into uh, another crop of the same family. For example, I can have two types of squash in my garden. I might have crooked neck squash, and I might have straight neck squash. Right? So, you know, they visibly are different. They're both yellow, you know, but they with crook neck squash, got a crook in the neck, and then the straight neck squash is straight. When it came to, when it comes time for those crops to pollinate, if I take the pollen from the straight neck squash and dab it on the flower of the crook neck squash, when that uh, squash develops into a squash, it'll have the attributes of the straight neck squash. So it will be a new squash, a new type of squash that is mixing the two genetic profiles of those two different varieties of squash, 
that's a hybrid, right? So when that plant grows, it'll have new attributes of both. It'll, have, it'll, have, it'll, be a new, it'll look different than both, than the straight neck squash or the uh, crook neck squash, but it will still be a squash, still be edible, the whole thing. Um, another example of a hybrid that we're commonly we see is the orange carrot. The orange carrot is not the original carrot. The you know, original carrot was a lot darker. Um, and over time, like back in the, the 1800s, like botanists was like, yo, we want to create a carrot that's high in beta carotene, so and high in vitamin C. So they kept splicing or or they kept pollinating different types of carrots together in order to get the orange carrot, right? This is totally different from GMO or genetically engineering a crop. In order to genetically engineer a crop, you need to be in a laboratory where you could take the DNA from one plant or animal and splice it into another. And nobody I know has that capacity, right? But I am, you know, I don't see anything wrong with hybridizing, you know, a crop. You know what I mean? You could hybridize. Hybrids exist for different reasons, right? So, uh, again, you know, genetic engineering requires you to have some sort of gene isolation equipment, which you don't typically have as a farmer or a gardener. And this particular graph shows you what that process looks like, right? Um, but with a hybrid crop, like people hybridize crops for many different reasons too. You know, it's like disease resistance, drought resistance, uh, taste, flavor, size, you know, uh, shelf life. Like there's a lot of different reasons for hybridizing stuff. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna leave, it, leave that right now and I'll probably give you some reading material so you can dig in on that a little bit better. Um, so what are the principles of organic farming uh, since we, you know, people do GMO, well, let me say this, the argument for GMO crops is that, you know, we got to feed millions of people and, you know, climate change is happening and we need to make sure that the crops can survive harsh conditions. So, you know, let's put other animal genes into it. But what we've learned is that, you know, we can grow food in abundance if we just focus on you know, uh, a couple of different principles that will allow us to have nutrient-dense crops that is accessible for people uh, out in the world. And one of those met, one of those techniques, uh, one, or some of those principles, are soil health. And if you don't learn anything from me, if you don't, you know, if if you don't hear if you don't hear me say this, if you don't take anything away from this class take away that the foundation of your garden and the, 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 the qualifier for your success in growing anything is the health of your soil, okay? It's the heart of the matter, right? The quality of your soil is, 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 is gonna make, it makes a difference of whether or not you're gonna have like disease, pests ridden, crops or if you're going to be able to drop a seed and put some water on it and that thing jump up in two days, right? Um, so in order to build soil health, you know, you got to add organic matter. And when I say organic matter, I mean like compost to your soil in order to build its uh, nutrient content, but also to build, its so build your soil structure, which uh, when I say soil structure, what I'm talking about is the porosity of your soil, whether or not it can hold water or absorb water quickly, uh, whether or not it uh, uh, dries out quick or not is a, a, a major factor of whether or not you got, you know, whether or not your plants are going to survive because those root systems inside of your plant are super delicate. I mean, I, I mean, the moment that it dries out, those those uh, root structures start to uh, uh, dehydrate, and they'll die, and then your plants will be stunted, right? Um, 
good, healthy soil also has an abundance of microbes, right? And organisms. When I say organisms, I mean it has insects, it has bacteria, good bacteria, it has little teeny worms and you know things flowing throughout it that will allow it to uh, to, to that, that these these uh, life forms compose what is called the soil food web. Like these things live inside of the soil. They break down the compost and organic matter and the dead anything dead inside of the soil, and they eat it. And then they release nutrients that your plants eat. So people say they go garden and like, oh my God, there's bugs in my garden. Like, bro, like, yes, you need them. They are good. It's not a bad thing. All bugs are not bad. Um, but, you know, we're so used to not messing with the bugs in the, in the garden. So, you know, we get to tripping over the bugs. But, I mean, worms are a prime example of, a, of an organism that's inside of your soil. That is a good sign that your soil is healthy. Uh, roly polies, you know, being in your garden, there's shredders, there's little earwigs, all those things are down there breaking down stuff. Then there's on a microscopic level, there's bacteria, uh, there's micro, there's other types of, uh, there's things like nematodes, good, good nematodes, bad nematodes. There's, there's stuff happening, there's soil life. There's life, the soil is alive. Good, healthy soil is alive. It's got a bunch of stuff happening. It's like millions of microorganisms and a handful of it, right? So, um, you know, when you're talking about healthy soil, that's the, that's, 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 that's the work. That's what takes the longest to do when you're talking about gardening and farming. Building healthy soil takes, uh, it, does, it doesn't happen in a season. It doesn't happen in two seasons. You can build those building blocks but it's going to take a year, two years before you really got good, rich soil, especially if you're gardening in an urban environment, right? So, yeah. Uh, good soil also has nutrients. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 the plant, just like human beings, has need of, you know, elements, you know, nitrogen, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, uh, phosphorus, um, and it's like it's like seven main ones, and it's like fifty other ones. I, I I'll get to that. We'll get to that when we talk about organic growing methods. Uh, but the plants are thriving off of the nutrients that are available inside of the soil, and we're eating the plants for the nutrients. If your plant, if your soil doesn't have nutrients, your plants won't have nutrients. And when you eat the fruit of the crop or whatever you've grown, if you don't, if the, the nutrients were not in the soil, then you're not going to get the nutrients in your body. You can't get something from nothing. All right. Um, another challenge, um, you know, one of the things about urban soils is that they're so depleted. So we got to build up and add nutrients to the soil, uh, which is, you know, that we'll be covering that on, on another day. Um, and then we also got to reduce the amount of tilling that we do to the soil. Every time we till, we break it up and we kind of disturb that, that life that's, that's happening beneath the soil. So we try to till as less as possible. Um, and then we also try to make sure we plant the type of plants that are healthy, uh, that can grow healthy in our climate and our environment. Because if we don't, then, you know, it doesn't matter. That plant, it, it, it's not fit for that uh, community. Uh, another element of organic farming is um, pest, natural pest management. And uh, what that means is like uh, cre creating an environment that will prevent pests versus like having to spray a bunch of stuff to get rid of the pest. And so uh, there's a wide range of different practices that people use for pests, for natural pest management. They could be, um, you know, taking some neem oil or getting, uh, some uh, cayenne pepper or, you know, whatever. There's like, you can make some concoctions from ingredients in your kitchen uh, to spray or put on your crops. But the best uh, pest management is preventative pest management. So again, building your soil health, uh, your plants have an immune system uh, that will prohibit them from being eaten by pests or catching your disease if your soil health is high, right? So that's, that's, that's one of the things we'll be discussing. Um, but another method is to add uh, 
uh, or to attract beneficial insects. So what that means is like I can plant a whole row of collard greens, right? And if I plant this whole row of collard greens, if I don't plant some additional flowers, native plants, you know, if I don't increase the, the diversity of the crop, then, you know, them harlequin bugs come out uh, around this time, they about to come through and eat everything because there's no uh, plants to attract their natural enemy inside of the garden, right? So, you know, when we plant our gardens, we try to put in as many flowers as possible to not only help with the pollination, but also to help with the attracting of beneficial insects. So, you know, uh, you'll see that on Saturday, uh, you know, there's, there's a certain type of, there's a certain type of uh, insects like ladybugs, uh, praying mantises, there's, uh, uh, there, there's like certain types of bees or wasps that come in and do their thing and be killing off, you know, the caterpillars. It's all types of stuff happening in the garden, but you can help, you know, cultivate a, 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 a natural pest management system by integrating, you know, these native plants and flowers into your garden. They'll attract the insects that'll eat the, the bad insects. Um, another method or principle of organic farming is um, weed management. Um, we talk about managing weeds. Um, first thing is, you know, a you know the hardest part of gardening for me that has been has been weeding, but you know if you do it right, if you set up your site correctly, then you don't have to worry about a lot of weeding. Right. So the first thing is, you know, of course, pulling the weeds or tilling the weeds in. The second is uh, uh, what we call solarizing, uh, putting down some sort of tarp or something like that to actually scorch and kill the weeds in advance. Um, and then the third, of course, is like, you know, mowing, cutting, cutting them out. Uh, and then the third, which is the one that I love the most, is mulching. So putting mulch on your garden soil uh, is one of the most effective methods to keep weeds at bay. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can mulch your garden. You can mulch your garden with hay. You can mulch it with, uh, you know, wood chips and wood bark. Um, you know, I personally, I use a, a ground cover, a geotextile fabric, and I cut holes into it and plant inside the holes to keep the weeds at bay, right? So there's a lot of different ways you could do it. We'll show you some examples on Saturday. Um, and then uh, next, another principle is biodiversity. Um, one of the most important things to remember in your garden is to kind of have, to think about your garden as a microcosm of what's happening in the wild, I guess, right? <laughs> Which is a misnomer in and of itself, because like, where does the wild stop and where, the, anyway, um, when you're gardening, think about going out into a forest or a field or a meadow. There's nowhere on planet Earth where plants are growing in a natural environment where it's only one type of plant. And if it's only one type of plant, it's a problem, that's, that's indicative of a problem. So when we're talking about biodiversity, it's creating a space that has as many different types of plants as possible, right? Like, like I was talking about native plants for pollinators, uh, for pest control, but also planting plants that help with cre help create a system of interdependence between the plants, right? So I might plant, you know, uh, like the Three Sisters Garden. We were talking about indigenous agricultural systems earlier, so. You know, the Three Sisters Gardens is corn, squash, and beans, right? So the uh, squash uh, creates uh, a kind of like mulch with its leaves, because if you ever seen squash leaves, they're huge. The corn is growing upward, and then the beans are wrapping themselves around the corn, you know, to establish themselves. But what's amazing about this interdependency is that th that's just like the aesthetic and the functionality of the plant structures. Well, beneath 
the soil, the, the, the beans are actually pulling nitrogen out of the air and storing it at the, in the soil to plants uh, like, uh, you know, green beans and things like that are what we call nitrogen fixers. So what they do is they absorb through their leaves, they absorb nitrogen out of the air and store it inside of the roots. And so that makes it available inside of the soil, right? So, you know, the same thing goes back to companion planting or to uh, uh, the idea of like having a biodiverse space, like different crops inside of your space might attract better, you know, types of beneficial insects. Um, but there's also, you know, m be mindful, you know, there are some plants that don't play well with other plants in close proximity. So, you know, you might not want to be planting like onions next to tomatoes because the onions are letting off something that the tomatoes might not like, right? So that's, a, that's also something to keep in mind. Um, let me see All right. Uh, and then the last piece is... Uh, uh, you know, environmental sustainability. So this, I was talking about this the other day to my homie. We went up to Charles City to go check out a farm. And I was telling him, I was like, you know, this food justice stuff is important, but there's another layer of what's happening on the planet. Um, you know, because of human beings and their, 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 you know, just the way that we roll on the planet, we haven't been taken care of, you know, uh, the soil, we haven't been taking care of uh, the environment in any way, but this type of farming and agriculture and gardening is a way for us to get connected back to sustainability and thinking about how our gardens can serve as a tool for or keeping uh, uh, water in place in our urban environment, so stormwater management, um, these gardens and green spaces can also serve as a as a vehicle for us to recycle. So composting, keeping stuff out of the landfills, could be a is a way that gardening, farming, agriculture can uh, sequester carbon and keep it in place. Um, you know, and then just as a as a as a overarching kind of like idea. Um, by, by connecting inside of the garden, you also realize that a lot of this stuff that we uh, do to the planet is not, uh, it's not healthy for the planet, but it's definitely not healthy for us. And that if it's not healthy for the planet, it's definitely not healthy for us. So thinking about how uh, there, there are enough resources for us, but you know, I grow enough for myself and my family and then I grow enough for everyone else, but I'm not trying to waste nothing. You know what I mean? That's a, by getting into this work, we kind of start to think about waste and how we throw stuff away and it, it all goes somewhere, right? But how do we keep, you know, how do we create a closed loop where whatever we waste can be used right back in our gardens and green spaces? Um, okay, I was supposed to put that in there. So anyway, uh, let's see, what time is it? Hold on, I don't wanna, all right. We're at 8.30, um, I got 30 more minutes, right? So I'm gonna I'm a talk about food justice, but before I go further, I wanna make sure, uh, do we have, let me check and see if we have any questions. I don't wanna go too fast and, uh, you know, yeah, I miss miss anything. So, uh, so anybody anybody got any questions, thoughts, feedback before we go through the next part of this? Oh yeah, good. Am I going too fast? All right. Let's see. All right, we all good. All right, let's go. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I see that there was a, there was a thing in the chat. Okay. Yeah, and I'll send you the slides after this. Okay. All right, cool. All right. Let me go back to the All right. Yeah, I still see the screen up? Because I, 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 I should have, I don't know. Hold on. Let me see. All right. Um, all right. So, 
you know, we talk about food justice. What is food justice, right? How do we define food justice? Um, from my vantage point, food justice is, you know, well, I'll just read the definition. It's the right of communities everywhere to produce, process, distribute, access, and eat good food, regardless of race, class, gender, ethnicity, citizenship, ability, religion, or community. This is not to be confused with food access. Someone can give you food access, but in order to have food justice, you gotta do some work. Somebody can give you justice, you gotta take justice. So look, so there's a couple of different headings under uh, this that uh, when we talk about food justice that had to be addressed, right? Um, let me see. Let me show I cover. Look at my notes. Let me see what I have. Yeah. So um, the first kind of like area to address when we talk about food justice is like the historical trauma. That's talking about the, the the pillage and colonization of land, not just in America but uh, all over. Um, you know, slavery, colonization has upended traditional and indigenous methods of growing food all across the planet, and has also caused disconnect for communities of color and their relationship to the land. So when we talk about food justice, um, one of the things that we have to go through in order to get to food justice is address that historical trauma that has occurred as a result of slavery and colonization, right? You know, people be feeling like, yo, I don't want to do, I don't want to farm. Why? What happened? Why, what, what disconnected you from the land? You know, um, a lot of times people are still processing that stuff and trying to figure out how to reconcile these emotions and these feelings of, you know, somebody did something to you on the land. Is it the land's fault or, you know, is it the fault of the people that did the thing to you? Um, another element is, uh, you know, community development. Like, how does uh, how does the food system serve the communities in question? Are the members of the community have ownership of the aspects of the food system? That's a major delineation between access and justice. Is often you can give people access, but that don't mean that they have ownership, right? Um, Another element is food sovereignty. So, you know, food sovereignty is basically whether or not you have de de defined for your community what kind of food is being grown and how it is being grown. So right now we have limited expressions of food sovereignty in our community. If you don't have access to healthy food and you're not growing your own food, then you're at when with somebody else telling you what food needs to be grown and you have no control whatsoever on how that food is grown, right? Um, another element of food justice is like the whole kind of like hunger food pantry, you know, system, right? It's like that's a major component of how people who don't have access to healthy food are fed. It's like they're relying on this food pantry system. And as a result of the reliance of the food pantry system and like the lack of proximity to healthy food, then there's all these health disparities that occur. And then, you know, just overarching, it's not like the industrial food system and processed food in general is trying to make you healthy. These are decisions that you have to make for yourself. Um, another element of uh, food justice is land access and land ownership. Who owns the land? I just read somewhere there's like 98% of rural land is owned by white folks and 2% um, land is owned by blacks, Asians, and Native Americans. 2% of rural land is owned by black, Asian, and Native Americans and Latinx communities. Combined. Like, combined. So, you know, if you don't have access to land, how are you going to farm? If you don't have ownership of land, how do you determine how long you farm on the, on the property? And then lastly, labor and immigration 
is something that none of us like to talk about, but it's how we are all complicit in food injustice on a day-to-day -day basis. The labor that goes into growing our food is often immigrant labor. Folks that come from the global south to grow food or like growing food in the global south and then it's being exported uh, to you know the US and other you know quote unquote first world countries, right? But you know when we think about Latinx communities coming up to the US, it's not like they're getting paid twenty dollars an hour to grow strawberries for you in the winter. Right? So, you know, we all play a role in this thing. Um, so let me see. I'm going to show you a video from one of my OGs. Um, oh, and this is a quote that I, that I kind of like that informs this work for me. If I can control your food, I can control you. K. Rashid Nuri is the founder of Truly Living Well in Atlanta, Georgia. He's trained hundreds of farmers, urban farmers. Uh, but this quote kind of like packages this thing for me in a really resonant way. But I'm going to show you a video from Malik Yakini from the Detroit Black Food Security Network. Um, and then we're going to come back uh, to this. I'm going to try to uh, answer a couple questions. We'll, we'll be, uh, I'll be out your hair. Let me see. Uh, Hi. My name is Malik Yakini, Executive Director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. We're currently at Detroit Farm, the point of farm that our organization operates in Rouge Park, the city's largest park right on the west side of the city of Detroit. We started Detroit Farm in part as a response to the lack of access to fresh, healthy, affordable food in the city of Detroit. In fact, the lack of access is so acute that researcher Mari Gallagher came to Detroit in 2007 and characterized much of Detroit as a food desert, an area, according to her definition, where Detroiters have to travel more than twice as far to get to a major grocer as they do to what she called a fringe food location, or what we call in Detroit a party store, a store that sells alcohol, cigarettes, tobacco, potato chips, candy, and other things that can only nominally be considered to be food. Because of this lack of access to fresh produce in the city of Detroit, many Detroiters are suffering tremendous health problems, including rates of childhood and obesity, which are off the chart, soaring rates of diabetes, and soaring rates of heart disease. All of these things are controllable by diet. So rather than just complain or lament about our condition, our organization practices self-determination. We think it's important that the people themselves stand up and find solutions to our problem. One of the solutions to the lack of access to fresh, affordable, healthy produce in the city of Detroit is urban agriculture. And while Detroit has more than 1,600 gardens and small farms in the city of Detroit, this Detroit farm is currently the largest of those farms. We grow more than 30 different crops here at Detown Farm, including traditional row cropping um, and growing in coop houses, which allow us to extend the growing season and in some cases allow us to grow all year round. We currently have four hoop houses on the property, which allow us to do significant growing even during months like November, December, when traditional farmers are not able to grow anything in this climate. In addition to the production of fruits and vegetables at the farm, we raise bees both for the pollination of the crops and also for the production of honey, which we sell each year at our annual harvest festival. We also cultivate mushrooms. We have a demonstration area where we're currently mastering the cultivation of mushrooms and we're hoping by next year to begin to bring mushrooms to the marketplace. We sell at various farmers markets throughout the city of Detroit, including the C. Wayne Farmers Market right in the center of the city on Wayne State University's campus. We sell at Eastern Market, which is the largest farmers market in the city and one of the oldest farmers markets in the United States. We sell at the West Side 
farmer's market, the Northwest Farmer's Market on the west side of the city and other smaller farmer's markets throughout the city. We also sell right here at the farm on Saturdays and Sundays. Detail Farm is our most labor intensive project and our largest project, but it's only one of many projects of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. In addition to Detail Farm, we were instrumental in writing the city of Detroit's food security policy, which was unanimously passed by the city council in March of 2008. That food security policy analyzes the current condition in the city of Detroit in various areas, including how food impacts schools and institutions, looking at retail sale of foods in the city of Detroit, looking at the impact of food on the environment, looking at emergency preparedness and various other ways, again, in which food impacts the population of the city. After we analyzed the current situation in all of those areas, we made several recommendations as to what Detroiters can do to improve the food system that impacts our lives. The most important recommendation in the City of Detroit food security policy is for the creation of the City of Detroit Food Policy Council, which was actually seated in November of 2009. The Food Policy Council has 21 seats, including six seats which represent the grassroots community, three seats which represent the city government, the mayor's office has a seat, the city council has a seat, and the Department of Health and Wellness Promotion has a seat, and there are 12 seats that represent various sectors within the food system, such as sustainable agriculture, retail food sales, workers within the food system, and we have a seat that represents environmental justice because we understand the interplay between agriculture and the environment. The Food Policy Council meets every month to implement the recommendation in the existing food security policy and also to make new recommendations to the city government in the city of Detroit so that we can work together to localize the food system impacting our, our lives and also to make recommendations so that we have greater food justice in the city of Detroit. The Detroit Black Community Food Security Network is concerned not only about food access, but we're concerned about food justice. We're concerned about people being treated justly by the food system that we have to interact with to obtain food. For example, currently in the city of Detroit, the vast majority of the millions of dollars spent on food are extracted from our community and go to people that don't live in the city of Detroit. We think it's important that we implement strategies that allow us to capture larger and larger percentages of that food dollar and to circulate them within the city of Detroit, not only creating wealth and greater access to food, not only creating jobs, but also most importantly, creating ownership of the means by which we produce and distribute food in the city of Detroit. In addition to Detown Farm and our role in the creation of the Detroit Food Security Policy and the Detroit Food Policy Council, we operate the Ujamaa Food Co-op which at this point is a once a month food buying club in which members of the co-op pool their money together in order to buy from a national distributor so that we have a savings on our food dollar. We also operate the Food Warriors Youth Development Program, which operates in three schools throughout the city of Detroit, in which we train young people in, to do urban gardening at the schools that they attend. We also teach them about the detrimental effects of industrial agriculture, both on the environment and on the health of human beings. Also, very importantly, we participate in undoing racism in the Detroit food system, an effort that looks at the role that race plays in determining who has access to fresh, healthy, affordable food, and also looking at the role that race plays in deciding who profits from the food system. This effort has been instrumental in causing people doing food work in the city of Detroit, particularly those doing urban agricultural work, to function more intentionally in the communities in which they work, so that they work to empower those communities as opposed to coming in with a missionary approach. All of these efforts are designed to raise the consciousness of Detroiters about food, the role it plays in our lives, and how we can impact that food system. If people would like more information on the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, they can access our website, which is www.
www.detroitblackfoodsecurity.org. Again, that's www.detroitblackfoodsecurity.org. Or they can call our office at 313-345-FOOD. Again, that's 313-345-FOOD. The Detroit Black Community Food Security Network is working to organize Detroit's majority population to play a role in shaping the food system or reshaping the food system that impacts our lives. We think that food is one of the most important elements in redefining what Detroit will become. And in fact, we say that the reality is there is no culture without agriculture. Thank you. All right, um, let me see. So yeah, so, uh, all right, so you just heard from Maliki King. He's one of my elders. I really appreciate him because he's, he's really been representative of what it looks like to be connected to the movement and connecting black liberation work to food justice work in a very, very clear, clear way. So uh, what we're gonna do right now, uh, you know, in pre preparation for us to, you know, kind of jump off at nine, um, I, I want to try to see if I could ask y'all some questions to bring y'all back to life. You know, um, I'd like to hear from y'all. What are some of the reasons that you have for growing your own food. Um, I was gonna try to figure out how to do this group thing in there, but I don't know what I'm doing with that, so I'm gonna kinda like forego that, okay? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just like they're supposed to be, at, we're supposed to be able to do breakout rooms. Okay, hold up, hold up, hold up. I'm good. Uh, It's not really. Well, it doesn't matter. We got enough people. All right, so yo, so we got we got six folks on the call, seven folks, including myself. So, uh, just I'm gonna throw this out there. What are what are two reasons uh, that you have, and you can answer this in the chat too if you like, so we can have documentation of it. Uh, what are some reasons why you feel like it's important for folks to grow their own food? Don't everybody answer at once. To be self-sufficient. That's a great, that's 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 a great, great reason. Really important reason, in fact. In fact, when we talk about this COVID crisis, you know, it becomes even more apparent how uh, precarious our food system really is. You know what I mean? When the COVID jumped off, you know, I went into the grocery store and they said you only can get two packs of chicken at a time. I got a family of six. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. I only can get two packs of this thing? This is not going to work out for, for my household. <laughs> so, you know, self-sufficiency is important uh, as far as this conversation goes. Um, also, to know where your food comes from, right? That is definitely important, you know. Um, a lot of times we don't know where our food comes from. Um, what have we got? No stronger bonds in the growing food with folks. Yes, community building is definitely an attribute of, you know, this work, you know. Gardens, you know, bring together people that you probably would not meet otherwise. I mean, I'd be, I, I can testify to that. that. I've met folks that I probably would not have had a conversation with otherwise, but our common uh, bond was food, you know, and how to grow it, you know. Um, it helps build our neighborhoods up, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's real. And, you know, and working together to do that work is amazing. Um, what else we got? Connection to the earth has a positive effect on mental health. 
you know, the presence of digging in dirt is great for anyone also to get an experience, especially in community, also not relying on imported food. Uh, we don't know where it came from. Yeah. Yo, have y'all heard about the concept of food miles? Right? I've heard of food miles, right? Food miles. Uh, they said that the food travels an average of 1,300 miles from the field that was grown to our plate. 1,300 miles. So how is that impacting the environment? Um, how is it? What, what happens if uh, the highway system gets shut down for some reason so that food can't or, you know, can't get into the city? That's important to be thinking about. Um, to learn to cultivate life, to grow something from a seed to something productive and nourishing is really important. Yes. You know, I, that's that, well, I'll categorize that as like connecting back to the planet. Uh, you know, the, the mother nature is magnificent, you know, and the design of how this stuff works, you know, the cycle of life is ridiculously compact and while it is very scientific and you know you can really like break it down in a lot of different ways but a seed grows because something else died you know what i mean that's that's it's a phenomenal metaphor for living um composting like without this stuff breaking down and turning into a nutrient dense fertilizer for our garden, you know, imagine a world where stuff didn't decompose, you know, or look at the look, go to the forest. Like nobody breaks the leaves in the forest, but the forest is lush. And those trees have been there for hundreds of years because, you know, they're in tune with the system. Um, yeah, uh, what else is it? What Lawrence said, it's time to make our own salt. <laughs> you got that right, Jack. I see somebody was reading, the, the <laughs> somebody read the recommended reading. Yes, indeed. Uh, decreased negative environmental impacts, most definitely. Yes, so that's this is this is the work. This is uh, the work of greening our cities, you know, gardens improve the air quality, yo. You know, the more green spaces we have, the better the air quality. The plants absorb carbon dioxide from out the air, right? So, you know, that's an important thing, you know. Uh, gardens play a role in increasing the biodiversity of life. So it's like, the, you know, the, the, not only the insects, but the birds, you know what I'm saying? The squirrels, rabbits, you know what I mean? Like, those things need to come back. We can't, like, exterminate all of the all of the wildlife. It was important for our planet to live to have all of these different interplays between animal and uh, wildlife. You know what I mean? And the garden helps create a space for that to happen. Um, you know, gardens create a space for us to have, you know, healthy soils where water can be absorbed. We talked about stormwater management earlier. So a garden is actually a form of green infrastructure in your neighborhood. And, you know, stormwater management is an issue because we all drink the water. Where does the water go when it goes into the sewer? It goes into the river. It goes to the wastewater management system. We live in Virginia, in Richmond. We have a combined sewer overflow system. So when you wash your car and flush your toilet, that water combines in our sewer system and goes to the wastewater treatment plant. If it rains too much, then that... Wastewater treatment water overflows and goes into our rivers, right? So you creating gardens literally is improving the water quality of our city, literally, like in real time. And, you know, as far as like the negative impacts, we're doing this. So, you know, people are in Richmond doing this stuff, but imagine there's people in every city across the country that are engaged in the same work globally. You know, people are doing this work. So, you know, we're all playing a role in, like, helping to regenerate the planet and bring justice to our communities, you know what I mean, through the production of food. 
And I think that's a magnificent thing. It's, it's really gives me chills to think about how interconnected we are and that you got people that are doing, that are part of this movement from Richmond, Virginia to Richmond, California, to Brazil, to Canada, you know what I mean, to China, to Africa, you know what I mean, Britain, all over the planet, Australia, people are all tuned in to the same work, you know what I mean? And it's really a part of us, like, figuring out how we can <clears throat> use urban agriculture and use food production as a tool for mitigating what's happening to the planet. You know, and then just in terms of ourselves, you know, like increasing our own access to fruit, fruits and vegetables, you know. If you grow it, you'll be more likely to eat it. And I tell that to everybody that comes into our spaces and work. It's like, if you grow it yourself, you will probably eat it. But if somebody else gave it to you, you don't see the value in it. It's a different type of relationship you have to it. So, for example, eggplants. Like me personally, I really ain't, before I started growing stuff, I didn't really never ate no eggplant. But now I do because, like, I I realize that there's so many different types of eggplant. Like, all eggplant is not the same. And all, you know, you see the emoji. It's only, that's, the, that's one type of eggplant. There's, like, dozens of others. You know what I mean? There's white eggplant. You know what I mean? There's, like, lavender-colored eggplant. You know what I mean? There's, it's all types of stuff. It's, like, little small ones. Little, so it's, it's all types of varieties of food that you've never seen. Like you go to the grocery store and the stuff that, you know, they give you like 16, maybe 20 different varieties. But even at, even in those varieties, there's like dozens of different types of those varieties, which is fascinating to me. And it, it's just like, yo, it's a never ending story of where can I get some seeds from to figure out what I like, you know what I mean? And what fits my palate as a, a person of African ancestry out here um yeah so nutrient levels and our food is reducing in industrial ag you know more the more we grow you know the more the, the more we incorporate these organic methods the higher the nutrient levels we can uh create in our in our in our food um oh so but she said what do you do with the eggplant oh man we made this Oh, so my boy made this uh, this eggplant baking. So he took the eggplant and dehydrated it, right? And then, like, served it like it was bacon. Right? Sliced it up into thin strips, you know what I'm saying? And served it like that. Um, but most commonly, I put eggplant in my stir fries. When I, when I uh, stir fry vegetables, you know what I mean? So it's like um, I dice it you know, and put it inside of, and, and stir fry, pan fry it. But, you know, some people like, you know, to bake it into like lasagnas or whatever. I've had that and that is delicious. See, the thing about it, I don't like eggplant chunky. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, I'm on a tangent. Oh, somebody said eggplant curry. Oh, I would love to see how you do that. Um, um, see, look. Peel the skin, soak it in salt for 20 minutes, chop it up, and roast it, baby. Oh, put it on the grill, son. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. So, yo, so, yeah, I mean, like, that's a part of this. That's the part of the glory. That's the part of the joy. So, look, let me tell you this. So, for me, mental health-wise, like, gardening has been, like, the godsend for just unlimited joy. I have – I go into my garden – and like I am like always optimistically looking forward to like what's happening next. So I'm seeing like when I'm seeing the peppers pop off and tomato, that's giving me, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, oxytocin. You know what I'm saying? Like it's jumping off like, yo, this is amazing. So it's like a, a form, it's a tool for connecting, you know, on a higher level to your own like hormonal need for connecting back to the earth, but also like success. You know what I'm saying? Like something happened that you were participatory in and now it's happening. And it's like, you know, it's working. You know what I mean? We need that. And we also need that communally to be able to experience that together in groups 
and neighborhoods and you know what I mean and tribes or whatever like we need that experience together because that like helps bond us and, and helps the, connect us on a deeper level uh, and then not to mention like I save money you know what I mean like y'all I'm just saying I ain't buying no squash I ain't buying no peppers I ain't buying no tomatoes you know what I mean? So all that money that I would spend on cabbage or spend on carrots or spend on, you know what I'm saying? I'm not spending that money. You know what I mean? And, and so at a very basic level, like, yo, in your own household, when you get into this work, you'll realize, like, yo, I'm literally, like, every time I plant something, I am saving money. Like, you know, I might spend a dollar on a pack of seeds, but imagine when those seeds start to produce, I ain't got to buy whatever it is that I'm growing. So you do the math. How much space you got to grow? Oh, it's crazy. Then not to get into like, you know, you raising chickens, you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, you might even get funky, you might have some goats or whatever. I don't know. But literally, like with the chickens, we got five and we always got eggs. Like every day. And, you know, you might be vegan or what have you. So just, you know, think about how much space you have to grow, you know, whatever vegetable is accl acclimated to this environment, to this, to this, to the conditions. And then, you know, you might be sophisticated enough to grow some tropical stuff in your backyard in the greenhouse. So it's like, you know, the possibilities are endless. And it gets ill when you start thinking about how you can sell what you grow or sell what you make from what you grow as well. So it's just like this compound effect. It gets, it gets nuts really fast. So, um, yeah, man, that's, um, that's tonight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just leave it there. We got like five minutes left and I'm gonna just kind of chill out because we can, I can go all day on this stuff. Um, I want to ask you all to please, uh, complete your mini farm profile sheet um, so I can have it before next week uh, so I can start thinking about how we can, you know, I can make sure I cover all the stuff that y'all are trying to learn. Um, next week we've started, we're going, uh, we'll be talking about seeds and propagation uh, of plants, how we grow plants, how we uh, start from, whether we're starting from seeds or we're starting from trans or planting transplants or, you know, we're doing potato slips or ginger or, you know, growing something from a cutting or whatever. We're going we're gonna to dive into that type of stuff next week so I can get you all started at the, um, the base. Saturday, we're going to be at Farm to Family, and we're going to be talking about healthy soil. So bring some boots or bring some shoes, some sneakers that you ain't afraid to get dirty. Um, bring some gloves. Um, wear pants. I mean, you know, it might be hot, so you can wear shorts. But I mean, just make sure you have some protective foot covering, something that you got on your feet. That's that don't wear no open toe sandals, because it's like, you know, that's not a, that that won't be a good idea. Um, we'll meet at eleven o'clock at Farm the Family, and um, I'll be going over what healthy soil looks like. Um, we'll be going over. Uh, Methods to keep your garden water. We'll be talking about weed management. Um, and um, I might get y'all to help. I might show y'all how to utilize some tools in the garden just to kind of get some hand-on experience. I guess we got some uh, some things that will be uh, some practical, applicable uh, techniques to help build healthy soil that um, we'll be able to show you on Saturday. How do y'all feel? I hope... Put it in the chat. How you feel? How's it, how how did this how, how's the first night? I'm look, so this is my first time doing this boot camp on this Zoom thing. So like, you know, y'all gotta give me feedback. You know what I mean? I'm trying to make sure we do this in a way that, you know, we socially distance and you know everybody get the information. Um but yeah, you know, I'm thankful uh for all y'all showing up tonight. And um I look forward to seeing y'all on Saturday. And if you have any questions, any questions about this presentation tonight, I'm going to send you the link with the PowerPoint, and I'm going to send you the actual link to the recording. 
you have any questions, don't hesitate to hit me. You know, send me an email or whatever. You know, send me a text message or whatever. I'm here. That's what I'm. By virtue of you coming into this mint, into this space with me, I'm I'm making myself accessible to you for any questions, thoughts, concerns that you might have. So you know, we got four weeks to do this, and I'm I'm trying to grow y'all to be as you know finessing and as 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 dope growers as you possibly can be. So you know, if you got a question about something I didn't cover. Some that I might have just skimmed through, don't don't hesitate to hit me. Um, so yeah, uh, if, if anybody got any questions, feedback, thoughts? If not, uh, I'm gonna let y'all go. It's at, it's eight fifty seven. What's good? Y'all good? Talk to me now. All right, that's what's up. Well, this concludes uh, week one of Southside Growers Academy Boot Camp. I will see y'all on Saturday. Y'all have a great evening. Be on the lookout for an email from me with the PowerPoint from tonight as well as the video. I hope y'all have a great evening. Peace and blessings.